Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? This morning, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to read out of Hosea 3 1, the love of the Lord. So, Hosea 3 is a really short chapter, it's just five verses. So, we'll have to go to the previous chapter. I think we can get some context there. But the whole verse says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So, in this case, they were um, getting involved in idol worship, eating things, sacrificed to idols. This has always been Israel's problem. Uh, in one form or another, and they were not following after God, but following after the world. And so the Lord was having to deal with this. So he goes, okay, Hosea, you're going to show them an example because they're all going to go, why is he picking up this, this wife? Because it's, a, it's an example to them <laughs> to convict their hearts. Let's go back to the previous chapter to the end. Let's see. Okay, we can get some context here. So let's go a few in. One, two, three, four, five. All right, we'll start in verse 18 in uh, of Hosea 2. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things on the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. They shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. So Israel is Israel. And this is, this is talking about end times. Israel is God's. Israel is Israel. Nobody replaces her. But he also mentions the church here. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. How interesting. That's just what it looks like to me. I could be wrong. Then the Lord said to me, Hosea 3, 1, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. See, this is a latter day prophecy. This is the <coughs> prophecy of the end times. This is all going to be in the millennial reign believer look back through all thine experience look look back in the past of your life and think of the way whereby the lord thy god has led thee in the wilderness and how he hath fed and clothed thee every day how he hath borne with thine ill manners how he hath put up with all thy murmurings and all thy longings after the flesh pots of egypt how he has opened the rock to supply thee and fed thee with manna that came down from heaven. <laughs> and we've talked about this before. I've looked back in my own life. I see him everywhere. I see his hand working in so many situations. Things that should have went one way but went another because of him. Amazing. Think of how his grace has been sufficient for thee in all thy troubles. How his blood has been a pardon to thee in all thy sins. How his rod and his staff have comforted thee. When thou hast thus looked back upon the love of the Lord, then let faith survey his love in the future. For remember that Christ's covenant and blood have something more in them than the past. 
He who has loved thee and pardoned thee shall never cease to love and pardon. He is Alpha, and he shall be Omega also. He is first, and he shall be last. Therefore, bethink thee, when thou shalt pass through the valley of the shadow of death, thou needest fear no evil, for he is with thee. When thou shalt stand in the cold floods of Jordan, thou needest not fear, for death cannot separate thee from his love. And when thou shalt come into the mysteries of eternity, thou needest not tremble, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, soul, is not thy love refreshed? Does not this make thee love Jesus? Doth not a fight, sorry, does not, doth not a flight through illimitable plains of the ether of love inflame thy heart and compel thee to delight thyself in the Lord thy God? Surely as we meditate on the love of the Lord, our hearts burn within us and we long to love him more. And indeed we do. And so as people, knowing what we know, learning what we are learning, we come to a place where we find more ways to love him and more reasons to love him. And how do we do that? Read the Bible. Because when things are, are starting to be revealed to us in the scriptures, we start to gain a greater understanding into Jesus' character into his, his attitude and his attributes, <clears throat> into his reasonings, why he does certain things and why he says certain things. And we start to see these little mysteries, these little tidbits of information hidden in the text. When the meaning of certain things starts to peel open, you know, your, your life experiences will help in the understanding of some of the Bible. There are some things that happen in here that scholars may not have no idea what they mean. But you, because you've had specific types of experiences in your life, you look at that and you're like, I, I understand what's going on here. I can relate to that. I've had a similar experience in my life. That's the Lord speaking to you through his word. Especially in the case of that giving you a greater insight in, into the Lord and who he is. We love him more. We love you more because all these things start to make sense to us. You know, whenever a man and a woman come together and they date or they talk or they uh, hang out and they get to know each other and their love for each other grows, it's the same thing with Jesus. The more we learn about him, the more we love him. The more you learn about that woman or that man that you're going out with, the more you learn to love them. Because you start to see different qualities and different little nuances and different attitudes, and different little things that catch your attention that make you love them more. If you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Most people today have no idea what that means because, one, they don't read the Bible. And right next to that, number two, is that they may not actually be saved and may not actually be in him. It may be a superficial profession because they don't know their Lord. Your salvation comes through him and him alone. We have nothing unless it comes from him. What a glorious thing. What an amazing thing. That we can have that through Jesus Christ. That we can come to him and learn about him and experience him and partake of him and learn to love him more. One of the things I found is that the more I learned the, of why he does things, I started to love him more because I saw what he was doing and that it was all based out of love. I stopped looking at the rapture as an escape from all the things that are about to happen and started looking more at it as him coming and collecting those that he cares about. Those that he has marked out and those that have chosen him. Those eagerly waiting for him. Those who hung on. Those who overcame. 
those who passed the test, those who, who stood against all odds. I stopped looking at it as a, as a rescue, which it is, and started looking at it more as you've done enough and you've gone through enough. Let me get you out of here because even more stuff is coming. There's no reason for you to be here anymore because we're not, you know, we're not appointed to wrath. There's no point, point to it. There's no point to us being here. You're not appointed to wrath. There is therefore no, no condemnation. Why, where people are getting their weird ideas, I have no idea because the scripture to me is clear. You just, you just, you start to learn to love him more because of all those little things. And the more of those you find in the Bible, the more of those you discover, the more of those you learn. And then he gives you insights into that with the understanding that you have. And you're like, these are more of those qualities that I'm learning about him. And these are the things that make me love him. It ceases, well, it not ceases, but it becomes less important that he's doing all this to, to get me out of here and keep me from hell. And more importantly, even though that's that's part of it, but more importantly, it's that he cares for us and loves us. You really start to learn about the love he has for us and how that is an eternal love. And then it becomes much more special, much more intimate, much more personal. It causes, in, in myself, it causes reflection, examination. causes me to realize I'm not worthy of his love, but that he gave it to me anyway. That's amazing. That is amazing. That even when we were in the throes of sin, he loved us anyway. Even before we were ever born, he loved us anyway. Even before the world was created, he loved us anyway. Knowing where we would be going and what we would be doing and when, he loved us anyway. And that's just a few of the things. But you got to read the Bible to find this stuff. You can listen to me talk all day. But when you read it yourself, when you see it, and your mind's eye picks up on it, you're reading it with your physical eyes, but then your, your mind's eye is like, well, wait a minute. There's something else there. It changes everything. And this is part of that becoming more intimate in that relationship with him. And it is a beautiful thing. It is an amazing thing to come to that place where you start to see things much more clearly as to who he is. What he did. What he gave up to gain that much more. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the debt you owe for sin because he loved you. He cared for you. And he wanted you to be saved. And he did that for each and every one of us that are saved. It wasn't in his job description. It's just what he wanted to do. And that he made the plan for this. This was all set in motion. Possibly millennia before, possibly even eons before any of this ever started. That's amazing. That's amazing. Because it just shows you the level of love that God has for us. The, the, the depth of the love. The detail of the love that he has for us. Can we not give him a little bit of that love back by showing some gratitude? By reading his word, learning as much as we can and, and doing it the best we can? By responding to him, responding to his word. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. Lord, I thank you that you loved us enough. Take that back. <coughs> I thank you that you loved us more than we loved you.
How could we have loved you if we didn't even exist? And yet, for beings that never existed, you loved us. You loved people that weren't even created yet. Before the earth was ever hung in the in the space in space. Before it was ever formed out of anything. You loved us. You knew who we were. You've known us from of old. This love has been, I mean, we sit here and we think, well, you know, Jesus came and then he went up and then it's been 2,000 years that he's been waiting to come and get the church. No, it's been longer. Much longer. Go back to the beginning. You've got, at, the, at this point, right at 6,000 years. But then what was before that? Where were we and what were we before that? And you were loving us then too. And had already had knew this plan was coming. This is amazing to, to just see the level of love from you, Lord, the, the, the depth of it, the detail, and that it's been there all this time since before anyone can count. And it puts much more of a finer point on what you're doing here in the scripture and that your plan for salvation, your plan to redeem the purchased possession, to redeem creation, to redeem mankind. That's a, and it just, it boggles the mind to, to think of, of how far away all this started. When it could have possibly started. And of course, we think in, in terms of wins because we, we were born within this time frame uh, and, and use time to measure everything. But in heaven, there is no measurement of time. Incredible that you loved us from any time before. And... We limit that because our understanding is limited. But your word starts to show it to us if we would bother to read it, if we would take the time to look at it and ponder it and meditate on it. <clears throat> we might get a closer or a deeper understanding of just what that love really is. Just how powerful it is. And it's funny because everything has culminated at the cross. And so we can look at the cross and we can say that is love because he did that when he didn't have to for people who didn't love him, for people who didn't know him, for people who weren't even born yet. He did that for all who would believe. And here we are 2000 years later. Just now realizing that. Amazing. It is just something incredible to sit and consider. Just the sheer weight and the gravity of what's been done for us. We can't possibly say thank you enough. We can't possibly do anything uh, or say anything to express this gratitude fully. Our, our languages don't have the ability because it goes so far beyond the ability to speak. It is something that a language only the heart knows. And Lord, may we all have that language in our heart and may it be speaking, Lord, we love you back. And we thank you for saving us and for loving us enough to save us and for giving yourself for us. And while we don't know what that looks like, while we don't know what that's going to culminate in, we just only have what the Bible tells us, we know it'll be greater than anything we can possibly imagine. Lord, what an amazing gift you've given us. May we even have a fraction of the understanding of how important it all is that we may glorify you that much more, praise you and worship you that much more, and have a little more gratitude and a little more love towards you for those things and for everything else. Because we have a book that records a bunch of stuff. Well, a lot of stuff happened that wasn't recorded, but look how much was. We shudder to think. I mean, just, just for you, Lord, when you were in your ministry, if all the things were written down, as the Bible says, the whole world would be full of books. What if we go back even further? How many books would it take? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for doing all this. And, th and thank you that not only was it for us, we sit and we think kind of selfishly about that, but this was for the Father, too. That you did the Father's will, that you redeemed the possession for the Father, that you presented something to the Father, 
And we have a record in the Bible that tells us, you know, that you're going to present the church to him. He's going to present us right back to you. Amazing. The, and it goes even further than that. We haven't even gotten to that part yet. There's still a little bit of a few things that have to happen. What a glorious picture it is. And what an amazing amount of hope it inspires in the knowing that the plan isn't finished yet and there's still things that have to be done. So there's a light on the horizon. And that light's getting brighter. Lord, thank you that you've given us such hope and such love that you have shared your love with us in our hearts. And make us to share that with others. Make us to share that with those around us. Those that we may, that are our enemies. Those that we don't agree with. Those that we don't see as being on the same level as us, that we would love them to. We love all those because everybody's made in your image. And whatever we do to one of them, we do to you. It's what your word says. So may we show that love to others. Because in that we glorify you. And that's the goal, is to live in a way that glorifies you. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. I love that the word I was given at the end there, uh, because it's funny because there was a, a verse that, that popped into my head this morning, and I'll actually have an opportunity to share that. Um, Love is a key ingredient in what we're doing here, in being saved, in, in the life that we live after we are born again. Love is key. And I want to take you to some verses here. Because the verse that popped into my head, because I was thinking about, you know, what I'm seeing happening. And the stuff with Alistair kicked off and I've seen a bunch of people getting attacked. For no other reason than speaking truth. This is in Galatians 5.15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. And it goes into walking in the spirit. But what's really great is to go up here. I've mentioned this before. Let's see. Okay, verse 6, Galatians 5, 6. And there's a series of verses here that tell us an interesting tale. You remember how we closed the prayer about the love. Watch this. Verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. And then there's a little commentary there. Love fulfills the law. You ran well. Verse 7, Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leaves the hold up. I have confidence in you and the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 14, and here's, here's where the culmination is. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we got people out there trying to speak separate things out and say, well, if you're doing this, then you're right. But if you're not doing this, you're not my brother or sister in Christ, but you need to be these things, these things. Okay. You've forgotten the most important detail. All those things, the, all the law, all the 10 commandments are fulfilled in one word, loving your neighbor as yourself. One John, it says that it, in big, and John quotes Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. He goes, here's that commandment. And if you read that, you see that it says faith and love. That's the commandment. It's the whole law hangs on those two, faith and love. Faith and love. 
Verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, which is what we see happening, that's what we've been watching happening, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is to attack people we don't agree with. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. I'm going to highlight this right here. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5.14 powerful. So when we see the example the Lord set with his love, we are to emulate that since we're made in his image, since his love is shed abroad in our hearts, we're to emulate that. And so now we can go elsewhere in the Bible, we look at the world stage, we look at how people are being treated and how they're treating each other, and we can go right to the scriptures and go, here's what the scripture says. Am I doing that? Some people will immediately respond with, oh, I know I'm doing it right. What a prideful thing to say. Because the right answer is, I know I'm not doing it right. I need to do better. And I need him to show me how. Back into the scriptures and into prayer. And all of a sudden, he'll show you. And then you learn a new way to walk. A way that glorifies him. And it is most certainly not attacking our brothers and sisters just because we disagree with something that they said or did. We're not their judge. The Lord is. So I just wanted to leave off with that because that, that popped into my head this morning and I looked at it and I'm reading it and I was like, whoa, okay, here we go. The law is fulfilled in this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. If you're not loving other people, and people will ask, well, okay, who falls under the category of my neighbor? Um, there's, what, just over 8 billion people on the planet? There, there's your neighbors. Every human being living on this planet is your neighbor. Easy. So you love everybody. What kind of love should it be? Go look at the example Jesus said. We just read it. That easy. All we have to do is apply it. Apply it to ourselves. And watch the changes happen. Watch the fun begin. And watch us, and we'll notice, we'll start to see things differently, know things differently, understand things differently, and respond to them differently. Because we'll realize that our little complaints we have are nothing. And what the Lord is doing is vastly different than what we think we should do because we only see from one perspective. He sees from all perspectives. And so we need to be a whole lot less critical of others. Actions are one thing, but we don't destroy or crucify a person because they did something we don't agree with or something that we think wasn't right. You know, we read about liberty. We do have a certain liberty. We don't use that as an opportunity to do something wrong, but we have a liberty. All things, what well, Paul said, all things are lawful, but not all things are good. So we need to pay a little more attention to what the Bible says in its entirety and apply all of it at one time. And then it starts to change how we might respond to certain actions, certain people and certain things. The, the goal is to respond in love. Either it's to correct something or it's just to share an opinion. I don't necessarily think that is, but then again, there's stuff I don't know behind the scenario. And to respond in truth. And there are times when the right answer is nothing. You don't say anything. Let it be. I see a lot of people, a lot of good people, good Christians, good theologians, turning against each other today. Why? That's not right. But it just goes to show the depravity of the world and how it's affecting every single person. Now that we know this, now that we can see it, we can go to the Lord in prayer and we can make some changes. So that we do our best not to fall under that. Not to fall into the trappings of the flesh, but instead walk in the spirit like he said in Galatians 5. 
see how the Lord puts things together. I didn't do that. It just popped into my head and I looked it up. I was like, perfect. We'll throw that right in there. And that was without even knowing what this morning's devotion was going to be about. It's all the Lord, guys. It's all the Holy Spirit. He's talking to us. He's correcting us. Pay attention to the word. That's where the truth is. And the word, the truth shall set you free. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.